So James, your latest book is on nihilism, um, the philosophy that claims life is meaningless. Most people see that as a bad thing, but you don't. Tell us why it's okay for life to have no meaning. Well, the idea of a meaning of life is of a grand evaluative context, like uh, you know, a master plan for the human race. Well, if there's one of those, um, then it could be good or it could be bad because it's an evaluation, right? You're taking a certain state of affairs and you're saying it's good or bad in some way. If there isn't one of those contexts, then it can't be bad and it can't be good either. All it can be is a, a fact, a fact about reality. So I think that's um, the, the problem that people have seen in nihilism, and this has gone on for a very long time now. I mean, people first started talking about nihilism in you know, the German Romantic um, 1790s. Mm -hmm. The terminology meaning of life and nihilism come in around the same time, and it's always, you know, the meaning of life is good, nihilism is bad, okay. Um, but that presupposes a religious context, and you see that from the very first use of, of the word. It's like, you know, we assume there's this big evaluative context, you know, and that's what makes your life good, living according to God's plan or something. So clearly somebody who turns their back on that, who doesn't follow God's plan, is terrible, you know, you don't turn your back on, on God's purposes, right, so a nihilist is terrible. But if you think that a nihilist is actually rejecting that context, then it can't be bad. Um, it only looks bad if you look at it from the context which the nihilist is, is actually rejecting. So it's, so it's rejecting the idea that there's an externally imposed meaning on life by some deity or kind of uh, yeah. transcendental sort of a being. That, that's right. So, I mean, so, so I, I mean, I don't think that, that, that that's true. Many people in the world, most people in the world have religious beliefs and do believe this in a valuative context. I've got no problem with that whatsoever. What the, the problem I have is people just presupposing there's something bad about nihilism because that seems to be a mistake as far as I'm concerned. And, and, and then the other thing I'm opposed to, I mean, I don't like being opposed to things, right? But I, I, I feel nihilism is so badly understood. It's, um, it's, that idea that arises from Nietzsche, which is that nihilism is a problem for atheists because, you know, without God to create the meaning, we have to create the meaning. And I think that's an even worse idea in many ways. So, so it, it isn't then that without an objective meaning, we're freed to create our own meanings, as it were, and impose, impose our own meanings onto, onto life. It's not, it's not a liberating thought necessarily. Well, if that's true, then it was always true. Um, and in a sense, in a very obvious sense, right, we are free to create our own meanings, okay? So I've got certain aims at the moment and I try and pursue them. You know, I'm trying to say something reasonably sensible in this interview, etc. right? Okay, and then later on I'll have aims of going and buying a beer and, you know, enjoying myself and then getting home and, you know, we have these projects and they lead into wider projects right throughout life. So yeah, I mean, we do create meaning. But the problem is, if you try and make that creation of meaning a substitute for the old religious idea of a meaning of life, then you have to pick on one meaning. And, if, you know, and that's baseless because there are, there are so many different meanings and the meanings change all the time as, as, as we move through our lives. So, you know, and then if you try and make it a substitute for the old religious idea, you're going to have to say, you know, you get the sort of disagreement which you see among philosophers, you know, some think that meaning is this, some think that meaning is that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're going to have that kind of meaning which we're making, then you have graduations of it. So maybe we'll work out that my life is more meaningless, meaningful than yours or vice versa. You know, it's a way of judging people, um, a baseless way of judging people. What about the context of uh, ancient Greek philosophy? So a lot of philosophy in Plato and in, in Aristotle was trying to establish what the best way to live a life is, what a good life is, if you like. Um, was that an attempt, in a way, to find the meaning of life? And if so, does that mean a lot of that philosophy was a kind of waste of time? No, I don't think so at all. I, th I, th I think they had a broader conception of ethics than we do today. Um, but I think ultimately all of those things have got to be considered as proposals. I mean, they had a metaphysics that backed it up. But I wouldn't call that a meaning of life, a grand evaluative context. So they thought that reality, I mean, certainly in Aristotle's case, was teleological in some sense. I don't accept anything like that myself. Um, but they were trying to work out what the good life for human beings were. I mean, I, I approve of that kind of thing. Um, what happens in contemporary debates, it seems to me, is, is um, you know, when people say there's a difference between ethically good 
and meaning, and they see meaning as something distinct which they've discovered. They've just, they're just broadening a conception of ethics. Um, you know, because a meaning of full life is always supposed to be a, a good life. Um, you know, just having a significant life isn't supposed to be good enough for some people, but, you know. How do, you how do you determine which bit is supposed to make it meaningful? I mean, an ethically good life, I think that's an easier concept to understand, and, you know. Right. But for the Greeks, were those two things running together? Sort of an ethically good life and a good life for someone to live, as for like a meaningful life? Yeah, I mean, life. Aristotle gives you a conception of a good life for a human being, you know. Mm. This, this is a good life for a plant or a cat or something like that, and this is a good life for a human being. That's, that's the way in which they thought. I, to me, those are always proposals which we can try, you know, that might be useful for, my, for our lives. I mean, there's a lot of things like this. In the 20th century, you get existentialists trying to revive that kind of conception, you know, live in an existentially free way, choose what you're going to do next. Maybe that will work for some people. Maybe it won't work for some people. I, I just see them as proposals. I don't think the nature of reality, you know, if you think in a meaning of life type way, you might think the nature of reality dictates that. And I think that's a mistake. I think these are proposals that might work for some people and might not work for others. So one of the philosophies that sort of liberated us from this kind of God uh, created world, a world that's given meaning by an external being, was materialism. Uh, and, you know, it, it sort of influenced humanity both scientifically and, uh, and philosophically and socially. But you argue that materialism has now also kind of enslaved us. So it liberated us from that picture, but it has enslaved us in a different kind of picture, especially when it comes to the idea of like progress and technological advancement. What's What's wrong with that picture? What's wrong with materialism? How has it gone bad, as it were? I don't think it's, well, I don't think it's true for a start. Um, you know, the claim of materialism, I think, must be false, given the nature of human experience, etc. And the last 70, 80 years attempts to try and say that it's something material or try and deny it that it exists. Uh, you know, I think the dissatisfaction is getting pretty obvious with that picture now. So I think it's false. I mean, it's a very old picture. But I don't think it's useful for people anymore um, because if you make experience seem mystifying or you have doubts about whether it really exists, etc., you don't reflect the way human life is moving, which is towards experience. You know, people are looking at screens more, people are entering into virtual worlds. If you've got a philosophy that makes all that seem problematic, it's not really going to be useful for us in our current day and age. And I think we're going to need philosophy a lot more than we've ever needed it in the years to come as we recreate these problems with this, this technology. Because I mean, we've got a situation now where it seems to me that, you know, you say out of control. Well, in, in a sense it is, right? I mean, when somebody comes up with a new technology that complete, will change people's lives, I don't really think that we just sort of accept it and hope it doesn't go wrong, you know? You see it in the sort of anxieties people have now, will, will artificial intelligence be the end of us, you know? It's almost like we're looking out at these meteors coming towards the Earth. Oh no, they're huge meteors. If it hits the Earth, we're all going to die, but hopefully it will miss, you know? There's people making this stuff. Um, and I think the human population has become sort of detached from this. We just sort of thought, oh, what were the clever scientists and technologists produce next? Oh dear, that's caused some social problems. You know, people are abusing social media or, you know, some people have become addicted to virtual reality. They can't get out of it. Oh dear, we'll have to deal with that. As if, as if you know, it wasn't people actually producing this technology and that, you know, that shouldn't be something that politicians are actually very interested in. So there's a sort of fatalism about it, that it's just, it's just happening, it's a process that is unstoppable. People often say this, progress is, you know, you might as well be against the gravity if you're against progress. It's not something that can be controlled, it's just yeah, a it's, natural... Yeah, that's right, but it isn't, it isn't necessarily progress, it's just something new coming along. It's an, I, I call it in my new book, uh, Cetus Technological Advance. It's just, continues and then we deal with what happens afterwards. I think we need some sort of co collective rational control over that process, you know, it en needs to enter the democratic process. Philosophy opens people's minds up to big issues exactly like the, the meaning of life and thinking about our lives and our reality in a wider context. And I think that's exactly what we need. It also has a distinct advantage in this, in today's world of being neither science nor religion, but able to reflect rationally on both of them. 
You also don't need any equipment for philosophy. You know, anybody can do it. It's also something that people are just naturally interested in. You know, small kids are very interested in philosophical questions, and then they're told not to ask anymore. You know, how did, how did reality come along? You know, come about in the first place? Well, nobody knows. Let's let's just stop. You know, that's what we need to do. I, I make it compulsory in primary school. Yeah. So you, you reach back to a very different philosophical tradition, idealism, for finding sort of your way out of these dead ends of materialism and um, philosophically and, and socially. Uh, idealism, of course, has a very bad rap in uh, Anglophone uh, analytic philosophy. People well, often associated with Barclay's uh, philosophy that matter is not real, everything is made of ideas. Yeah, what is been, idealism for you? There have been lots and lots of different forms of idealism in the history of philosophy. And after doing my talk on it this afternoon, a lot of people came up to me and said, yeah, I really like, I really like the way you're thinking about it, but I'm not sure about idealism as a title. Well, you know, in a way, I'm not sure. In, my, in the first book, I, I didn't call it that. I called it the transcendent hypothesis. In the second book, I thought I'd try and tie in with tradition. I changed the label. I didn't change the theory. Maybe I still haven't got the right label for it. but. But the idea, I think, is quite simple to get across, and I could do it. So I, I think the reason it can seem confusing how matter and experience, you know, can possibly exist alongside each other, is because we're thinking of experience in a limited way. Um, we think of an experience like a pain or a tickle as something you can you're aware of, just like you can be aware of a you know a table or or a camera or something like that. Okay, there it is. There's the pain. There's the tickle. Okay, we think of it as a kind of separate, independent reality like the physical world, and then we try and put the two together. Um, of course, a materialist says only you know, the physical is an independent reality. The dualist says there's both. The panpsychist tries to insert the, the f mental into the physical. But there's another way of thinking about experiences, and that's to think of it as, as a context or arena within which things appear to us. Right? So within my, con I mean, we, it's, it's built into our language, right? Within my conscious experience, physical things appear to me, right? And so do mental things, experiential things. Tickles appear to me, dogs and cats appear to me, tables appear to me, okay? The way I see it is whether we go physical or we go experiential is, is a matter of explanation. Um, what's appearing to us, that's a reality um, conceived within consciousness right and then the independent reality is outside of consciousness so idealism for you is a way to make better sense of experience what about other th another big topic for idealism which was freedom do you think idealism is a way of making sense of how we can be free in a material world given that we're material beings yeah and, that, that's, and how a, that's another one I, I i took on in in gods and titans yeah i think um I think we're free, and the um, I was actually surprised when I started looking into this. I um, I assumed I would take a compatibilist line, but in the end, I just just decided there's no reason to think determinism is true whatsoever. I started to think it has a lot to do with astrology and various superstitious beliefs, and looked into the history of how people started to believe in determinism. So, right. determinism isn't true. I don't think there's any reason to think we're not free, and I I now. I surprised myself five years ago I didn't think this, but now I think that uh, determinism is just a superstition. <laughs> and uh, one final question, can you tell us a little bit about the way you fuse jazz with philosophy? What do the two have in common and how do you Well, you know, jazz bring was, the two together? has been my thing since I was, what, 11 years old and I first heard Cannibal Adderley and then I got a saxophone and uh, I was going to be a jazz musician. I went, I was into jazz before I even knew anything about philosophy. I went to America to Berkeley College on a scholarship and that's what I was doing. But then of course I got into philosophy when I moved down to London. So I've always been doing the two. So it reached a certain point in my life, I thought, can I combine these in some way? So I, I tried to, you know, it's been doing this for years now, sort of like insert some of the philosophy into the music by getting my actors and singers together and then uh, we made an album, an uh, album I'm very pleased with back in 2016, in which we, you know, I think it's pretty credible. It works as jazz and it works as philosophy. And then since then, I've been trying to do more and more of it. It's hard to do because it's so unfamiliar, so nobody will, nobody will give you a gig. But if anyone wants to give me a gig, we are. The Jazz Philosophy Fusion Band is available and they're good. They're all professional musicians apart from me, but I'm a professional philosopher, so, you know, that makes sense. <laughs> 
James Sartaglia, thank you very much. Thanks. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.